Hi, um, I'm Stephen Sirfuss, and this uh, video is a critical review of the course Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. The Introduction uh, to Genetics and Evolution was given by Mohammed Noor. Mohammed Noor is Professor and Associate Chair of Biology at Duke University. An introduction uh, to Genetics and Evolution was offered aside from being offered at Duke University is offered online by uh, through Coursera.org. Uh, critical thinking is an important part of scientific endeavors. Indeed, Dr. Knorr encourages his students not to jump to conclusions. The following is my critical review, first part of Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. What is evolution? Very good question. In science, the precise definition of terms is very important. Genetics has its own set of novel terms, such as nucleotides, codon, codons, indels, and SNPs. Uh, genetics also gives new precise definitions to terms such as sweep and hitchhiker. So what is evolution? Dr. Knorr gives this definition, change through time over generations change through times over generations is a very limited definition of evolution. Change through time over generations only covers a small subset of evolution. Evolution is commonly understood to be a theory that includes the origin of life and origin of the species. With our current knowledge of DNA and genetics, evolution has, sh has to show changes in DNA sequence, and that's covered in other videos. Uh, if you're not that familiar with DNA and, and genetics, other videos on our site are obviously other videos uh, widely available on the internet. In genetic terms, evolution has to show changes in genotype that explain all phenotypes. Changes in genotype that explain all phenotypes, because DNA is the genotype. DNA sequence is known as the genotype, and phenotypes are what we see in all living creatures. And so changes in genotype, evolution, in other words, genetics would show the relationship between genotype and phenotypes. Evolution has to show changes in genotype that explain all phenotypes. Hopefully that's clear. Much to my surprise, Dr. Noor retakes Darwin's outdated example of the peppered moth as his first example of evolution. Honestly, this is more an example of change in the diet of birds than any change over generations. And I will keep this simple. Darwin observed both white and black peppered moths in his day. As Dr. Knorr points out, the British or London smog came and went. Now we observe both white and black peppered moths in our day. <clears throat> there is no observable change in phenotype, so we would have no reason to assume a change in genotype. Also, only a fairy tale genetics would expect a random change in nucleotide sequence to occur at the exact moment in time that would produce black speckled moths with selective advantage over white speckled moths. Darwin's speckled moths make a great tale, but modern genetics prove it wrong. From the moth tale, Dr. Honor moves on to argue the mathematical inevitability, mathematical inevitability of evolution. Dr. Knorr chooses an imaginary population of squirrels to argue inevitability. Type A squirrels run randomly, and type B squirrels fear asphalt. Type A produce one offspring before they're run over, we assume, while type B produce two offspring before possibly dying of old age or whatever. As time passes in his imaginarily, imaginary simplistic model, there will always be 100 type A squirrels in the population, always. Type B squirrels will be double their will double their population every generation. So what does the professor prove? Certainly nothing biological or genetic. 
Dr. Knorr has kept all the biological and genetic variables out of his imagined example. Knorr presents the biological and genetic variables as givens. Knorr only proves as inevitable the results of a mathematical formula. Nothing more. Serious scientific inquiry into the probability or inevitability of evolution, explaining a population of squirrels in which we observe a combination of phenotypes which enable the whole population to move, as well as unique phenotypes which allow type B squirrels to identify asphalt and fear it is more complex. Before we could apply math to this problem, we would need to identify the specific DNA sequences that produce phenotypes of muscles, bones, joints, nerves, lungs, blood, neurons, eyes, and so forth. How many nucleotides are in each sequence that produces each phenotype? Nucleotide changes are most often produced one at a time. Sometimes two nucleotides change. We're talking here about changes, uh, we would say mutations. Normally we see one nucleotide mutation at a time, uh, the technical term for that being SNPs. Sometimes two nucleotides change in, in, a, in, a, in a specific um, gene or section of DNA that we may be looking at. So what are the probabilities that these specific DNA sequences occurred as a result of random changes in the DNA sequence. Since genetics deals with mutation rates, this is a valid scientific question. The answer to this question is certainly not a probability of one over one. Inevitability would be a probability of one over one. I will close with a traditional in-video problem, traditional for those of you who have taken this course. What is the mathematical probability that running over a squirrel in Louisiana will change a single nucleotide in germ cell DNA of some other squirrel in the population? Let me read that question to you again, and you can work on that off video. What is the mathematical probability that running over a squirrel in Louisiana will change a single nucleotide in germ cell DNA of some other squirrel in the population? And I will leave you that problem. If you need help in resolving it, you can uh, email me and we will give it a shot. Um, we have a web page, or I have a web page called www.thednaproblem.com. And our email for any questions or comments is the DNA problem at gmail.com. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it.